This is State Street. Good morning, good morning. It's good to have you all here. Say good morning to those in the virtual sanctuary. We're ready to worship. Are you ready to worship? God has been good, and we need to give him a hand clap of praise, and we're going to go ahead and start worshiping. Really? Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, yes, yeah, since I laid my burden down. Oh, glory, glory, mm, hallelujah. Yeah, since I lay my burden down, well, glory, glory, hallelujah, oh, since I lay my, my burden down, guess what, I feel better, so much better, since I lay my my burden down, well, I feel better, mm, so much better, hey, since I lay my, my burden down, friends don't treat me like they used to, since I laid my burden down. Well, friends don't treat me like they used to. Yes, since I laid my burden down. Oh, and every round goes higher, higher. Well, since I laid yeah, my burden down. Oh, every round goes higher. Higher, yes, since I lay my burden down. One more look. I'm going home to live with Jesus. Since I lay my burden down. Oh, I'm going home to live with Jesus. Oh, since I lay my my burden down, oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my, my burden down, oh, glory, glory, hallelujah, oh, since I laid my burden down, God bless you today. This morning we're going to be reading from the 100th Division of Psalm. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all ye, all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gate with thanksgiving and into his course with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercies, his everlasting, and his truth endure to all generations. May the Lord have endured to hear it to his holy word. Let us pray. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the opportunity to assemble here in your name. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace. But most of all, Lord, we thank you for salvation through your Son, Jesus. 
We pray that you open your spirit here yeah. in our church for worship. Please, Father. We know, Heavenly Father, that you are spirit, and they who worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we do just that, Heavenly Father. Bless the, the messenger. Give him the words that you see fit to give to his flock. Help him to spread your gospel and your divine word. We pray for the sick and shut in this morning. We pray for the doctor's skills and knowledge to heal the sick. We pray, Heavenly Father, for comfort and strength for any families who have lost loved ones during this difficult time. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. This song I'm about to sing is a song that we all um, grew up on and a uh, song that I grew up on and really didn't understand what it, the words really meant, you know, being young and stuff. But uh, eventually as you get older and you go through a lot of things and you wonder like um, um, how you got where you are and uh, being able to see another day and gets through the sicknesses and all the trials and things that goes on in life. Um, this song right here, when you're glad to be in the service, one more time, that meaning that you're glad that God blessed you with another day to just be able to say thank you and to be able to fix all the mistakes that you did yesterday, and he gives you another chance to be able to correct those mistakes and to give you the opportunity just to be able to thank him and ask for forgiveness so uh, you could be saved. So uh, I'm going to try to sing this song. I'm glad to be in the service. Glad to be in the service. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service one more time. He didn't have to let me live. He didn't have to let me live. Oh, I'm glad. To be in the service one more time. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service. Yes, I'm glad to be in the service. Oh, I'm glad to be in the service for one more
I'm glad to be in the service. Yes, I'm glad to be in the service. Yes, I'm glad to be in the service. One more time. He didn't have to let me live. He didn't have. going on. I'm glad to be in this service. And let me just say, we had service during Bible school, vacation Bible school. It was awesome. It was off the chain, as they would say. So if you didn't partake of it, just 
wait till next year, I guess. But anyway, <laughs> it was good. And I do appreciate every effort that was put into it to make it as good as it was. Uh, Deacon Jackson and Deaconess Jackson did a marvelous job uh, to get everything organized. So we're anticipating next year. We're anticipating next year. Um, I would just like to welcome any visitors that we have uh, virtually or in the sanctuary. We're glad that you're here with us and we hope that you will come back again. I have one announcement. Uh, our pastor's first anniversary is coming up. Amen. It's Amen. Sunday, August 13th at 10 a.m. Reverend James Tex Thomas, the retired pastor of Jefferson Street Missionary Baptist Church in Nashville will be the speaker and there will be lunch after service. So you all just keep that in mind and have a wonderful week. Amen. Let the church say amen. Let the church say amen again. Glad to be in the service just one more time. And when you think about the There we go. <laughs> but when you think about what God has done for you and he has graced you with the ability to worship him just one more time, we thank God for that. Amen. 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 Just a couple of uh, brief uh, announcements. Is that where we're going first with announcements? I'm sorry. I don't have everything with me this morning. All right, so so basically, uh, just want to reiterate some um, announcements here. The deacons of the month for the month of July with Deaconess Sharon Blakey and Deacon Barry Blakey. Please keep them in prayer as well, in which they are grieving because of a loss in their family, a death in their family. So um, please keep uh, the Blakey family in your prayer as well. Next week, next week, next week, the 17th through the 21st is the Union District annual session, the Union District annual session is next week in which uh, I will be preaching on Wednesday. Wednesday night I will be preaching, it was the youth night beginning at 7 p.m. It will be at Oakland, Mount Zion, amen? Oakland, Mount Zion, the start time, there are two sessions, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Uh, the afternoon is at 3 p.m. and the evening is at 7 p.m. I would love to see your face in the place amen church meeting church meeting will take place this is our church meeting which must be announced and according to our bylaws will be the last wednesday of the month last wednesday of the month at 6 p.m is our church business meeting in which you will hear from our leaders and our chairpersons on how the church is going and any incoming activities july the 26th 6 p.m is our church meeting. Habitat for Humanity, Habitat for Humanity, that uh, we will be helping someone build a home, amen? We'll be helping someone build a home in which we have been blessed, amen, to have our homes, to have a roof over our heads, but there's somebody out there that is in need of help. So Habitat for Humanity, if you don't know who they are and what they do, that they build homes for individuals and that is our opportunity to be what Christ will have for us to be and that is to go forth go out and help our neighbors he says that you will know they will know that you are my disciples by the love that you have for each other amen so this is our way of State Street showing our love to the community so we'll be going out on August the 5th now there's two sessions okay or it can be one session you can sign up from 8 to 12 noon, or you can do 12 noon to 4 p.m., or you can do all day long with us out there, amen, in which you don't have to be a carpenter, you don't have to have any skill set. They will have those individuals on hand, but it's our way of showing our love, our care, and our affection to our community. More information is on the uh, TV screen right outside, amen. 
Amen. College Sunday. College Sunday is coming up. Amen. Those that went to college and those that are in Greek uh, organizations as well, we're asking that you wear your college colors or your Greek uh, paraphernalia as well. We're going to have an amazing service on September the 24th, 2023. Amen. CPR training, CPR training is come up. Never believe that the emergency cannot happen inside the church. Amen. We know that things happen inside the church where medical emergencies um, actually take place. And we've had a couple of here before. Amen. So what we want to do is be prepared and be the best that we can be at helping an individual who may have had a medical emergency. So on September, September that date is being finalized, but in September, we will have a CPR aid training in which it is a national accredited trainer and that your CPR card is good uh, for wherever you go. So there will be a sign up sheet after morning worship for that as well, because that depends on how many people sign up, depends on what we pay and how much we pay. Children's Church. Children's Church is every Sunday at 1030. We had such an amazing time at Vacation Bible School on this past week. The kids were out. The kids were excited. And that let's not kill that excitement. Let's not kill that joy that they have. So let them be able to come out to Children's Church as well. Amen. All the rest of the announcements you will find in the lobby outside on the TV screen outside in the lobby or you can check in on our Facebook page and our Instagram page or our website at www.statestreetbaptistchurch.org. It is now time for our mission statement. Our mission statement is who we are at State Street Baptist Church. Our mission statement is what it means to be a disciple maker. It's what it, we do here at State Street Baptist Church. As far as we going out, and showing the world and the community that we care about them. Would you please stand all over the building as we recite together our mission statement. Our mission statement reads as such, State Street Baptist Church seeks to engage the sinner, equip the saints, and exalt the Savior. Our focus is to offer unconditional love with unrestricted service. We are dedicated to being witnesses for Christ with fellowship, truthfulness, and selfless service with the highest standard of excellence. We are also dedicated to embracing every person with the utmost level of dignity and respect in accordance with the word of God. God demonstrated diversity when creating us, yet saved us all equally. We believe in the triune God. As Christ was actively involved in his community, we believe we should be active in the local population as well as the world. Through a variety of programs and services, we will strive to cultivate a ministry of physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Being obedient and honoring God's word, we understand our faith produces works. So with thanksgiving, prayer and meditation will become a living sacrifice which is holy and acceptable unto God. As that you remain standing as we sing our congregational hymn, Pass Me Not.
while we don't have a formal giving here in which we pass the envelope or what have you, I want to remind you that we do have a offertory uh, period in which you can be trusted based on what you know what God has done for you. Amen? Amen. We're able to do things as such as vacation Bible school to help the kids and uh, plan trips with them and other nature because of your giving. So I ask that you just continue to give that right outside the uh, sanctuary doors is a box for those that like to put their tithe uh, written out on check or in cash. There's an envelope there for you to drop it in the tithe box as well. Or we have Givelify and we have Square. Uh, the Square machine is right outside at our information booth in which you yourself can use your credit card or debit card in which you can give in a secure and a quick and easy fashion. Also, it's for those that's on Givelify, just to, uh, download the app Givelify and you can find State Street Baptist Church and you can give in that manner as well. Amen. Anybody ready for a word from the Lord today? Yeah. Amen. Amen. There comes a time in which we all have heard it before that I'm putting God first. I'm putting God first. Or as a matter of fact, we have actually counseled others to make sure that God has first place in your life. Now, such expressions we learn in the church are used so often that they run the risk of becoming what we call a Christian cliche. But there's nothing trite, there's nothing more true about the idea of putting God first. Amen? In fact, it's actually biblical. So after the next selection for the choir, won't you meet me at Hagar, the first chapter? I want to lift up in your hearing verses 1 through 16 as we deconstruct what Hagar is going through with the children of Israel about putting God first. With a sermon entitled, Priorities. Testing. Amen. Now we're a little short-handed up here, so we're gonna re rely on you to help us on this one. All right. Say amen. All right. I love to praise Him. 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 Oh, I love to praise His holy. Well, I love to praise I love to praise Him. I love to praise Him. Whoa, I love to praise His holy. Well, He's my rock, my soul, and He's my will in the will of a will. No, he'll never, 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 never. He's just the jewel that I have found. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love. Oh, 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 I love his holy. Well, he's my rock, rock. my rock, my and sword, and he's my will. 
in the middle of the wheel. Oh, I know he'll never, never, never. He's just a jewel that I have found. Hey, hallelujah, hallelujah. I love. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. praise his holy name. That when you think about how good God has been to you, then you can do nothing but praise his holy name. That when you think about some situations you've been in and how he got you out of them, then you could praise his holy name. That when you was deep in grief and he pulled you out of it and brought joy back into your life. Is there anybody here that love to praise his holy name? I, I, I say all the time, I say it all the time, that when you think about where you should have been, where you could have been, and where you would have been, if it wasn't for the Lord on your side, then that's what I, if, if, if I can't, if I had 10,000 tongues, it wouldn't be enough. That we can never say thank you enough. We can never praise him enough. So if you can't find the words to praise him, can I get about 10 people in here just to raise their hand and say, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, he brought you a mighty mighty long way. It's not my intentions to hold you long on this Sunday morning, but peace and blessings unto you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. It's such an honor and a privilege for you to join us in this space and in this place as we embrace God's grace. Amen. And thinking of that and with that in mind, then I ask that you meet me at Haggai. The first chapter, beginning at verse number one. Haggai, the first chapter, beginning at verse number one. You want to lift up in your hearing verses one through 15. Haggai, I'll give you a little time to find it. That's not a book that we usually preach from that much. <laughs> give you a little time to find it. Haggai, if you don't have your hard copy or electronic copy, it is on the screen for you right behind me. Haggai, the first chapter, beginning at verse number one, and it reads, 
In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvest little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountain and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why did I do it? Declares the Lord, because of my house, which remains in ruins, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltel, Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the message of the prophet, prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest. And the spirit of the whole remnant of the people, they came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Today I want to preach and teach using as a subject priorities. Priorities. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Let us pray. Lord, speak now, for your servant is listening. Lord, speak now, as your people are listening. Hide me so they can see thee, Lord. So, Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable unto thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the people say, Amen. Amen. Priorities. Putting God first means that we keep the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. In other words, we are totally invested in our relationship with God. Everything we have and everything we are is devoted to him. 
we hold nothing back. Jesus actually teaches us in Matthew, the sixth chapter, in that 33rd verse that he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else. As a matter of fact, he said it like this, first seek you the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and then all these other things shall be added unto you. That is, we are to seek the things of God over the things of the world. We are to seek the salvation that is inherent in the kingdom of God, considering that of greater value than all the world's riches combined. For what profits a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? The promise associated with the command is that if you are, not you, if we, or putting God first, he will give you everything you need. However, the grand jury has met. And I believe that there is an indictment against the church of not putting God first, but putting themselves. Priorities are out of whack. If you believe that this is something new in this generation, then I must inform you on this Sunday morning, July the 16th, that it is not so. It's not something new. Because we have a group of individuals, the people of God, who has their priorities confused? As you know, what I like to do is when I teach, let me give you the background so you understand today's breakdown. Because Hagar comes at a crucial time in the nation of Israel's history. Because Israel had just returned from Babylon. They had returned from captivity. And Zerubbabel is the governor and Joshua is the spiritual leader. He's the preacher. He's the pastor. And right here in this set of individuals, in this realm, is about 50,000 Jews. And when they get back, Deacon Harrison, they start to rebuild the temple of God. Because you remember Nebuchadnezzar came in and pilfered the temple, stripped the gold off the doors, took all the treasure out of it, and they have no place to worship. So as soon as they get back, the first thing they do is say, we got to have a place to worship. So they start to rebuild the temple. But then, strong opposition from the outside and indifference from the inside cause the work to be abandoned. They had a shift in their priorities. Satan on the outside and Satan on the inside. The outside opinion of some people and the opinion of those on the inside. You got the devil on the outside and you got the devil on the inside. You got the city, the government trying to stop the church on the outside and you got hell raises on the inside trying to stop the ministry from going forth as well. Hell on the outside and hell on the inside. And because of the two forces that's working against each other, the temple is stopped being built. The people just gave up. Isn't it interesting how just a one person can stop a ministry from going forth? 
because it's not their idea, so they're mad. Because they didn't think about it, they're mad. Because it's not the way that they want it to be ran, and they get mad. Because they don't have a title, they're mad. Because they don't have a position, they're mad. So they stop the ministry from going forward. In 16 years, this temple, incomplete, is just sitting there for 16 years y'all they are not working on the house of God so God in God fashion calls Hagar to Hagar and Zechariah I need you to challenge the people to continue to work on my house and to consider their ways before him. Because it is apparent that the people had quickly forgotten the captivity. And they are already growing complacent with their newfound freedom and prosperity. They, they, they forget that because they did not put God first the first time, that's what led to their captivity. And now here they are done with the captivity in Babylon. God has freed them. God has brought them back to their homeland and they're going right back to where they used to be. Two times in these verses, the word of the Lord came saying, consider your ways. He wanted them to consider the lack of effort in regard to the temple and the lack of spiritual intensity. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Let me talk to you this morning. You walk by here every day and you see my house is in ruins and you don't care that much about the house of God that you haven't even laid a finger and you, you don't care about the ministries that's going forth and you walk by and you come to church Sunday after Sunday and you see that there is a need for college ministry you see that there is a need for our youth. You see there is a need for missionary. You see there's a need on the usher board. And you just walk on by Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Just checking the block with God saying, at least I came to church. That's what you are doing. He, he says, come here. Let me let you know, Hagar, what they're doing. You have neglected God in so many ways. He said you neglected, number one, time. He says that these people say the time is not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Listen to that. They say it's not the right time for us to rebuild the house of God. He said, now is not the right time for you to join that ministry. You're saying to yourself, now is not the right time for me to be a member of the church. I mean, you've been back for 18 years. You've been a member for 18 years on paper. You've been serving 12 of those 18 years in leadership. But every time somebody asks you to give some more, now ain't the time. Whenever somebody asks for you to join this ministry, now is not the time. It's been 16 years 
since any productive work had taken place towards rebuilding the temple. The people were without a place to worship the God who had brought them home and away from bondage. And there seems to be no urgency in getting the house of God repaired and ready for work. If they didn't have the temple rebuilt, that means that they were not worshiping. And because they don't have a place to worship, they didn't worship, which now means they got their priorities wrong. They felt as if the time had not come. It is clear that a lot of Christians today are neglecting time. They just can't sense the need to be productive for the Lord. Apparently, they feel that the time will come, but it hasn't arrived yet. And there is no time like the present. We can't regain lost time. Do something now while you have the chance. Jesus says that no man works when it's night. But you got to work while it's day. Stop looking at your watch saying now is not the time. But, but, but if you look at their response, Hagar tells them that you have neglected rebuilding the house of God. And, and, and check out these people. I, I, I'm pretty sure that none of these people have uh, any offsprings here at State Street. So I know this is not State Street right here. But just check out what these people say. They made it sound real spiritual. They said, the, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. The people made their excuse sound real spiritual. They threw the name Lord in there. Now ain't the time for us to rebuild the Lord's house. They, they, they couldn't speak against the idea of building the temple, so they spoke against its timing. They knew that they needed to be active. They knew they needed to participate. They knew they needed to do something, but they couldn't go against that. So they said, now ain't the time. I'll just leave it for somebody else to do. I'm too old. I ain't got the strength anymore. <laughs> they say it isn't God's timing to rebuild the temple. Because of the great obstacles against the work, God's people began to rationalize and decided that it wasn't time to rebuild after all. Because of the opposition, because of the situation, they decided on their own, we can't do this. And for 16 years, they did nothing. For 16 years, they walked by day in and day out. And then no one think, shouldn't we do something about this? If it's so hard, evidently God doesn't want us to do it. That, that's what they were saying. They, they made it sound, they kept blaming God because of the situation, because of the opposition, because of the turmoil, it's apparent that God don't want us to do this. I told you they made it sound real. I, I know this ain't that state street. They, they made it sound real spiritual. Because God is causing all of this stuff to happen, then it must be his will for us not to do this. And for 16 years, they continue to tell themselves that lie. Because it's hard, it must not be of God. Let me let you know this morning that sometimes God wants you to think something is hard, that you can't do it under your control so that you can depend on him. Sometimes God will make you look at some situations as if it's something that cannot be accomplished, as if it's something that can't be done, as something that so 
so that you can stop depending upon yourself and depend upon him to bring it to pass. If we, Sister Bobby Thomas, I love you. It'll stick with me forever. She taught me, and y'all know I'm the instructor. I'm the facilitator of Bible study, but she taught me something in Bible study. She said, if you just move yourself out of the way. A lot of times, we get ourselves in the way. If we just learn how to move ourselves out of the way and let God have his way, then he will guide us. He will trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct their path. But so many times we trust ourselves. So many times we're looking at our own strength. But if Paul said it like this, in my weakness, is his strength shown. Yeah. But not only they neglected the time, they neglected just the temple itself. There was no cooperative desire to see the house of God established. They couldn't come together and decide how they were going. It was turmoil on the inside. And apparently there was no concern for a place to worship. The one place that God had ordained to meet with them was neglected and abandoned. It is dangerous to neglect the house of God. But we got so many people that don't support it with their presence as they should. They don't support it with their tithes and offering, and many do not support it with their prayers. There is no desire to see the church grow and expand, reaching lost souls for the glory of God. They don't show up for ministry activities. They always have something else to do. Listen, if, if we are not obedient and committed to the vision, we are neglecting the house of God. That when you don't work towards the vision, you are neglecting the house of God. You can sit on these pews every Sunday and still neglect the house of God. You can come through those front doors at 1030. You can be here for Sunday school by 815 and you can still neglect the house of God. You can have a leadership position and title and still neglect the house of God. That that's why I use it as a threefold ministry where it takes your time, talent, and your treasure. At one of those matter. But we got so many people who don't give their time, don't give their talent, nor their treasure. Because they are so concerned about themselves and they have their priorities wrong. And this is what God says. He says, this people, don't believe me, check it out. He said, this people, and we never in our lifetime want to hear God speak to us this way. You never want to hear God saying, this people, and not my people. That's his response. He says, this people. Because clearly, he don't recognize who they are. He said this because he saw their excuses and their poor priorities and noticed that they were not living like his people. So he says, this people. But then... It's not the work that they neglected. It wasn't just time they neglected, but they also neglected the truth. It's not time to build God's house. This is what they're saying. They're saying it's not time 
You've got 16 years. You've been back 18. Six, you've had two years off, but in these 16 years, you couldn't find the time to rebuild God's house. And the excuse you gave is that it's not time. I had an old chief warrant officer in the Army that had a sign on his door that says that if you can't find time to do it right the first time, will you find time to do it right again? So if you can't find the time to do it right the first time, then clearly you won't find time to do it right a second time. And th that's what God, God is actually mocking them. He says, uh, you say it's not time to build my house. Yet, you have taken time to ensure your house is together. Uh, think about that. He says, you say it is not time to rebuild my house. But you found time to rebuild yours. You can't find the time. Two hours vacation Bible school. One hour Bible study. Every now and then I get a little along with it. Hour and a half. I hear you up there, Deacon Jackson. Hour 15 minutes with me halfway. Bible study. Sunday school. You can't find time, but you found time to go shopping. You found time to go to the ball game. You found time to Netflix and chill. You found time to go out on a date. You found time to go do this, but when it comes to God's house, you can't find the time. And not only did you build your house up, you fancied it up as well. Top tier, swimming pool, granite countertops. You got the newest ride, 2023 edition. But you didn't find time for the church anniversary tax. You didn't find time to come and work, help, serve. But you got time for everything else. Is it time for yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? The people said that it wasn't time to rebuild the temple. In their actions, they said that it was not time. It was time to live nicely in rebuilt houses. And this was the real problem. It's not because they were living the good life. It's not because they had the fancy things in the house. It wasn't because they had the 2,500 square foot home but that they live in such personal comfort and luxury while the temple was in ruins. That was the, God is not mad because they have the nice house. They have the fancy car because they got the nice suit. He says, no, I'm not mad at that. What I'm upset about is the fact that you got your priorities mixed up. You put your own self first before the house of God. See, that's what I'm upset about. You paid your life membership for KASI. You paid your life membership for Omega Psi Phi, Delta Sigma Theta. You, you paid your life membership for that, but you won't tithe in the house of God. You went and bought some new shoes, went through four stores until you found the right pair, the right size, the right color. You ain't got time to come help with children's church. You ain't got time to sweep and mop and vacuum 
cut the grass. You ain't got time for that. But you got time to drive to Louisville. You got time to drive to Nashville. You got time to go everywhere else but to the house of God. I'm not mad that you went shopping, but you went shopping when you should have went worshiping. And the fact of the matter, for 16 years, this is the norm now. The fact of the matter is that you don't need more time. You just need more focus. That's what it's about. See, everyone has priorities. We'll arrange our schedules, budgets, and relationships according to perceived importance. Putting God first means we give him top priority over everything else. He is the principal figure in our lives and central to all we do and think. When we choose to put God first, we determine that he is more important than any other person. His word is more valuable than any other message. His will is weightier than any other word. Putting God first means we keep our lives free from idolatry in all of its forms. Putting God first means we strive to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Because Jesus' life was characterized by total submission to the Father's will. Service to others and in prayer. In the garden, faced with the unthinkable agony, Jesus prayed, not my will, but let thy will be done. He removed himself because Jesus was having a flesh moment. He could not deal with what's about to happen. He couldn't handle it. He was having an anxiety attack. But he moved himself out of the way. He put God first. He says, not my will, not the way that I want to do this, but Lord, let thy will be done. And sometimes we got to move ourselves out of the way and say, Lord, not my will, but let thy will be done. At first, the work is stopped because it is so difficult and some obstacles in the construction prevented the progress. And I know that there are some people that says we can't get much done at the church and I'm tired of living in a wreck and it's time to start the remodel at my house. God wants me to give attention to things at home because home comes first. Now, I said, that's the problem. However, family does not come before the church. I mean, family does come before the church. Family comes before the church. However, when you see God's house in ruin, when you see that there is something that needs to be done, then we should step up and do it and stop making excuses. The people were not invisible to God. They thought they were. He saw their lives. They lived in the desires that they possessed. And they were unconcerned about his house but they were diligent in obtaining good, fancy houses on their own. They failed to see the need for God amidst all their newfound prosperity. They had lost their focus. God had not brought them out of bondage to simply grow wealthy and prosperous. He had brought them out so that they might worship him and live for him. God has not seen us through the transatlantic slave route, through years of slavery, through years of torture, through years of oppression, through years of depression. He has not saw us through all of that so that we can forget about him now. He has brought us through. He has brought us a mighty long way. And we need to keep him focus the center but like he, he says I need you to consider your ways I like 
what God does when speaking to Haggai to tell the people. Because this is how you know it's of God or not. Y'all ready? Because God never points out a problem without offering a solution. You missed that, did you? God never points out a problem without offering a solution. He addresses their neglect, and now he's addressing their need. He says, consider your ways and the results of them. Haggai asked God's people to consider what direction their lives were headed and if they really wanted it to continue that way. The Hebrew figure of speech for this phrase is literally, put your heart on the road. If your heart is on the road, which direction would it take you? That's what it means to consider your ways. Think about this. If you continue doing this, where would it lead you? He said, you so much and you bring in little. The cause of their financial difficulties was their wrong priorities. They suffered setback after setback because the blessing of God wasn't in their pocketbooks. Hagar described a double curse. Instead of much, little was reaped. And the little that was brought home, it went away without doing any good. So you're you, you working and you're working and you're doing this, but because you don't have God first, what you do get, it don't last. You're just working in vain. Over and over and over again. And when things like this happen, the wrong thing to do is presume on the mercies of God. That's the wrong thing to do. Lord, have mercy. No, that's not what you should turn from your ways and you should turn from what you're doing and start doing better. He said, you drink, but you're not filled with drink. If, if our priorities are wrong, nothing will satisfy us. Each accomplishment soon reveals that there must be something more, something that can really satisfy. And nothing fills the God-shaped void in our lives except by putting him first. We often make life much harder than it has to be. God, this is what I like, God has not asked us to perform some monumental task alone. He hasn't asked us to work by ourselves. He simply wants to comply with his will. He has not changed. He supplied the resources. Check it out. When Solomon built the temple, God provided the resources then. He'll provide the resources now. God brought you through a long time ago. God brought you through COVID. God brought you through financial hardship. God brought you through unemployment. God brought you through so much, through sickness and distress. Don't you think that God still cares about you right now to see you through? He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. But you got to put him first before anything else. Because he has both time and responsibilities, we do well to pay more attention to the calendar, what I mean by seasons, than the clock on the wall. Be careful to redeem opportunities and lessons. Minutes and hours can be important but seasons are essential. The question that you should be asking yourself, what should I be doing at this season in my life? And I'll guarantee you that for each season in your life, there'll be a different answer. It is okay for you to no longer be a deacon. 
It's okay for you no longer to work on the usher board. It's okay for you to no longer be the church clerk, the church secretary, the outreach ministry. It's okay because for different seasons come different responsibilities, but you must be working in the house of God. He has not saved us to sit idly on a pew. It costs too much for us to sit there and do nothing. God has given us a finite amount of time on earth to accomplish his goals for us. His grace is sufficient for every circumstances. And his power is proven and demonstrated in our weakness. That, that, that's what God is. And as I get ready to close, you should be asking yourself, does my procrastination demonstrate a belief that I have been given unlimited time? Or am I working when God wants me to work? And I'm doing what he wants me to do. If that comes out moving chairs in King's Hall, then I'll do it. If that requires me to come out and vacuum the floor, then I'll do it. If that requires me to come out and just give my time, talent, and treasure, then I will do it. But the first thing that we must understand is the fact that we must make him first in everything that we do. Because Jesus says that if anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will end up losing it. Uh, but whoever loses his life uh, for my name's sake uh, will find it. Uh, you'll help me close this, won't you? Uh, for what will it profit a man uh, if he gains the whole world and lose his soul. Uh, what will it profit a pastor uh, if he preaches uh, from the book of Romans uh, and he loses his love for Jesus? Uh, what will it uh, profit the missionary chair uh, if they successfully launches uh, a disciple making movement uh, but they're intimate with, see, with Jesus uh, is no longer there. Uh, what will it uh, profit the gifted evangelist uh, if they lead 5,000 people uh, to profess faith uh, but slowly loses uh, their ability to abide in Christ? Uh, the profit uh, of the Christian life uh, is found uh, in our intimate connection uh, with the Father uh, through the Son and the Spirit. Uh, the quality of your life in Christ uh, isn't determined uh, by your success uh, in any other rule of measure, uh, but except by love. Uh, and it's even that something uh, that comes only uh, as a response to receive love uh, of God's goodness and grace. Uh, as I told the deacons this morning, uh, that Jesus uh, is more important uh, than your ministry. Uh, I know you drive the van. Uh, I know you cut the the grass. Uh, I know you sing the song during morning worship. Uh, I know you like to pray, uh, but Jesus uh, should be the center uh, of everything that you do. Uh, uh, don't get it twisted. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker the other day uh, on the back of a car uh, that says uh, that if Jesus is your co pilot, uh, you need to switch seats uh, and let him guide you uh, and let him drive your car of life. Uh, you need to keep Jesus first uh, in everything that you do uh, because sometimes uh, our priorities, uh, they get mixed up. Uh, we put ourselves uh, 
in the way. Uh, and Jesus, uh, he wants us to know uh, that he uh, that begins a good work in you uh, is faithful uh, to complete it. Uh, let me let you know, uh, I'm reminded of a story. <laughs> It was during the Olympics, uh, and there was a runner from a country. Uh, they didn't have good runners. Uh, they didn't have fast runners. Uh, and as soon as the pistol uh, shot off of the start line, uh, this runner, uh, he faced an injury, uh, and he went down, uh, and he hurt himself real bad. Uh, they carried him uh, uh, off of that track. Uh, they wrapped up his leg. Uh, they they bandaged his leg. Uh, they put him on some crutches uh, and said, you must retire. Uh, but later on that day, uh, he got on those crutches. Uh, he hobbled out to that track uh, and he limped through it. Uh, he went through pain. Uh, he went through frustration. Uh, he hobbled around that track uh, until he got to the finish line. Uh, and when he got to the finish line, uh, he collapsed uh, and the medics came running. And, uh, and the medic says, uh, why did you do this? Uh, we told you uh, that you must quit. Uh, we told you uh, you're done. Uh, we told you uh, you had an excuse. Uh, and the man looked at them uh, with tear-stained eyes. Uh, and he said, uh, my country didn't send me here uh, to start the race. Uh, but my country sent me me here uh, to finish the race uh, and I want to know uh, is there anybody here uh, that's going to finish the race uh, that God has put you to to. Uh, is there anybody here uh, that's going to finish uh, the work of God? Uh, you're going to rebuild his temple. Uh, you ain't going to walk by uh, and look at it in ruins. Uh, you're going to help uh, give. Uh, you're going to give some time. Uh, you're going to give some talent. Uh, you're going to give some treasure uh, that if the children's church needs you, uh, you will be right there. <laughs> When the trustees need you, uh, you'll be right there. Uh, when the finance committee needs you, uh, you'll be right there. Uh, when the kitchen committee needs you, uh, you'll be be right there. Uh, can I close this uh, like an old school Baptist preacher uh, that there's another man uh, who started a race uh, and they told him to quit. Uh, they told him to stop. Uh, they told him it was no good. Uh, but he said, uh, I was sent here uh, not to start the race, uh, but I got to finish the race uh, because uh, uh, the salvation of the world uh, rests on my shoulders. Uh, and they tell me uh, that one Friday uh, on a hill called Calvary, uh, they hung him high, uh, they stretched him wide, uh, and he finished the race uh, by dying. Uh, didn't he die? Uh, I'm so glad he died. Uh, they told me uh, they took him off uh, of that old rugged cross, uh, put him in uh, Joseph's brand new tomb uh, where he stayed there uh, all night Friday, uh, all day Saturday, uh, all night Saturday night, but early uh, that Sunday morning uh, he crossed uh, that finish line uh, where all power uh, on earth and heaven uh, is in his hands uh, and that same power uh, is what resides within us, uh, that same power is what should propel us uh, to give our best uh, to continue to work in the church uh, don't sit there uh, and let God's church uh, lay in ruins it's our priorities it's our priorities we put everything else first before God until something happens and then we come running back to church. Then we put God first. If you keep him first in your life, I guarantee you things will be better. Do I got a witness out there today? Do I got a witness and know that what happens because we all have lived that life where we haven't kept him first. 
But when you compare your life now and how you keep him first compared to what you used to do, things are a whole lot better. Things are a whole lot better. I guarantee you. But you can't keep walking by seeing God's house in ruins and not doing anything about it. God would rather for you. We, we, we had somebody at Sunday school that says that, you know what, Pastor? I used to do that. And that's the best statement that anyone can ever make. When you realize what you've done wrong, when you realize that you haven't always done things right, but when you recognize it, now you can do something about it. You, you can't get the alcoholic off the alcohol by yourself. They got to realize that they have a problem. Then Alcohol Anonymous will work. Therapy will work when you recognize that you got a problem. It's better for you to recognize it than God to tell you. We got to get our priorities straight. Our church needs us. Our community needs us. The people needs us. What are you doing? Are you sharing the live stream services? Are you talking to your friends, your family, your coworkers about church? Are you inviting them? That when we have cleanup day, are you helping? It's those type of things. God hasn't all given us the same gift, but he all gave us a gift. And that we all have a gift for the service of God. Your church needs you. Your church needs you. Won't you give your time, talent, and treasure? Because God gave us his very best. He gave us his very best. And the least we could do is offer him our services. Doors of the church are now open. Maybe there's somebody here who probably have realized that they have taken more time for themselves than for the house of God. Maybe they have taken more time for themselves than sharing the gospel with somebody. Maybe they're taking more time worried about themselves than their next door neighbor. Maybe if that's you right now, consider your ways. But I told you, God, when he points out a problem, he always points out a solution. You can ask for forgiveness right now, and he's faithful to forgive you. If you just realize that, hey, it was me, I did it. He's able to forgive you. He loves you. He cares about you that much. And when I say the house of God, I'm not just talking about this building. But we got some upcoming things coming up here at State Street. And that could be your service to help the church. It's not always internal, but it's external as well. Maybe there's somebody here that doesn't know God and would like to get to know him, but Jesus says, no man knows the Father except if he comes through me. So we right now offer Jesus Christ unto you as your Lord and Savior to help get you on the right path, that you don't walk by the church and never go in. We don't want you just to be part of, of this church. We want you to be part of the church. Because when Jesus comes back, he's not coming for 340 State Street. He's coming for the church the members of the body. And we don't want you to be left out. Maybe you're in our virtual sanctuary today and there is a link that's in the comment section right now that you can click that and fill it out. And a deacon or myself will contact you 
and that you can become a member of our virtual sanctuary where we offer Christ unto you. Now is the time. God has been too good to us for us not to care about his work. They started off good. They built the foundation and the altar and that was it. That was it. But don't stop the work. Please don't stop the work. He needs you. Now, here's the fact. If this sermon wasn't for you, if you're working, then good, great. We had somebody step up for vacation Bible school just this week that offered, put their, their time and their treasure into vacation Bible school to make the little kids happy. And those pictures that I saw of those children at that ice cream truck warmed my heart because somebody stepped up. And I remember a conversation that I had with them a couple of months ago. I told you taking the vision and not working the vision is how you neglect your church. They came to me and they sat down with me and they said, Pastor, we, we know the vision that you have. But can we take the vision and can we run with it this way? And because they came to me, I said, yeah, sure. And that was the best ministry that ever could have taken place. Because they put God first. She looked at me dead in my eyes. She said, I don't do anything without asking God first. That's how it should always be. Don't do anything unless you ask God first. And stop making up your mind what he's already said before you ask him. Let him speak and let him guide you and let him direct you. Here at State Street, there's room for everybody. We're not selfish. We don't work in silos. We work as a team and as a committee. If there's anything that you want to do, Feel free to come and talk to a deacon or myself. And we'd be more than happy to help you find your place here at State Street Baptist Church. We're not selfish. We're a church that loves everyone. There is room for you here at State Street. We stand all over the building. Lord, we come today to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. Despite our love for you, it did not deter you from loving us. So now in response of your love for us, we will show our love for you, Lord. That, Lord, we will get to work on your house whether that's being an evangelist of going out spreading the gospel, whether that just be going to a nursing home or a hospital, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, whether that just be sharing a social media post, whether that be typing in a, 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 a spiritual message every day on Facebook, is it just calling our brothers or sisters, we will no longer let your work go undone. And those things that are needed in the local church, in this building, Lord, touch our hearts right now, Lord, and move us in the way that you want us to go, Lord. Move us in the way that you will have us to move, Lord. Speak to our hearts and our minds, Lord, and let us be more like your son, Jesus. He stayed the course despite the opposition external and internal. He stayed the course, Lord, and he showed us that it can be done. So, Lord, right now we're asking that you search our hearts, and anything that's not like you, Lord, we're asking that you remove it and make us anew 
So create in us a clean heart and renew within us a righteous spirit so that we can be servants as you have called us to be. Because at the end of the day, Lord, when we stand before that great throne, you're not going to start with the title deacon, pastor, preacher, usher, pew member, but you're going to start with the word servant. And that's what we want to hear, servant. Well done. That's what we're aiming for, Lord. That's why we run in this race. That's our goal at the finish line. To hear you say, well done, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So, Lord, put a servant heart into, our mind, into us right now and let us be more like you. Those that gave today, Lord, from their treasures, we ask that you bless them, Lord, to let them know that these ministries can't go forth without their gift. So we will be responsible enough, Lord, to use the money as you have directed us to do, Lord. Those that give their talent, whether it be singing, whether it be teaching, whether it be preaching, whether it be using their gift from you for musical purposes, Lord, we thank you right now for them, Lord. And those that give their time to the church, Lord, we thank them as well, Lord. Let us change our priorities right now. Let us first seek you. And then all these other things will be added unto us, Lord. It is in the matchless name of Jesus, Lord, that the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. <laughs> we love you. And we praise you. Make us a perfect in every good work to do your will that is pleasing in your sight, Lord. God, who be glorified through Jesus Christ. And that the church all together say, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. You may go in peace.